But, you know, yeah, what, what, what really, and excuse, excuse my French, but what really pisses me off, right, <laughs> is when uh, gender professionals, right, like we, we, we have this like closed mind yeah. and we don't accept that there are other ways, there are unknown unknowns yes. and they go by the very poor quality evidence that exists, yes. right? Yes. Um, so I hope when, when, when I commented on your video, I hope you didn't feel like I was like disagreeing with you. I was just coming at a different angle. I, I kept a very open mind. Hello, Petru Surati, it's Jazz Gulati and welcome to today's episode all about the perfect TMJ exam. I'm joined today by someone really cool. Her name is Dr. Priya Mystery. She's based in Oregon, USA and I found her on YouTube and honestly, she is such a cool girl. She makes brilliant content for patients, actually. But I think as dentists, we can learn so much. In this episode, we cover about what a TMJ examination entails for her. Now, remember, a lot of these things we won't be able to implement in our practices, especially for GDPs, because she is limited to TMJ. She's limited to treatment of people with temporomandibular disorders. So what she does is way above and beyond what we do, including like CBCT scans, uh, a full body examination, while they're laying down so you get to hear her workflow so what we can learn from this episode is what do these people do that are limited or specialized in the practice of just TMD we also answer uh, towards the end of the podcast about what is her approach to someone with disc displacement without reduction these are people who used to have clicks and suddenly they're locked and they cannot open very much so how does she treat this very difficult condition to treat you see I've been reading the evidence I've been checking out and the evidence is very varied there's many different ways to approach it so I like to listen to her schools of thought and I want you all to keep a very open mind keep an open mind because a lot of what, what she teaches teaches is not evidence-based, it's not taught in dental schools, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. I'll tell you why it's certainly not wrong. Because the three arms of evidence-based dentistry, don't forget we talked about this in the Lincoln Harris episode, that the two other arms of evidence-based dentistry, aside from the literature, is the patient values and the clinician's expertise. Okay, these are two other arms. And the, the evidence that's out there in the field, in the entire field of TMD, it's very varied. It's very biased. It's very poor quality as a whole. So there are so many unknown unknowns. So just have an open mind when you listen to this. Yes, we talk about posture. Yes, we talk about the neck and stuff, but I think there's so much we can learn. I'm hoping it's gonna open your eyes, if not anything, then to at least the importance of the airway in your diagnosis and trying to get grips with patients who may have sleep disorder breathing. I know I always bang on about this, but I'm hoping you gain a lot of value from this. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you is when you're doing the TMJ examination, I want to make it obviously relevant, uh, use your pinky fingers to feel inside their ear. By doing so, you're doing an intra-auricular examination of the TMJ, which, which will give you more information. Why? Because you're gonna get closer to the back of the joint and that's when you can hear a lot of closing clicks and you'll see Dr. Priya discussing that as well. And the other reason is when we're feeling the lateral pole of the TMJ, which is basically when they open up and you can feel their condyle, that's what, that we're touching the lateral pole of the condyle that when we're doing that. That's not very well innovated. It doesn't have a great blood supply there. Therefore, by touching uh, behind the joint, i.e. from the intra-auricular within the ear approach, you obviously have to tell your patients you're doing this beforehand, otherwise they think what the hell is this dentist doing? You get to feel a much more innovative and vascular portion of the anatomy and you do gain some more information, i.e. is there inflammation, is there pain, that kind of stuff. So there we are, that's my producer dental pearl for you. And now let's join Dr. Priya Mystery, AKA the TMJ doc. Dr. Priya Mystery, Welcome to the Petrusive Dental Podcast. How are you? I'm well, and thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm great. And honestly, I'm so excited to speak to you today. Uh, and for those people in, in the UK, maybe around the world, who don't know yet who you are, uh, I'm going to give my sort of version of an intro, and then I want you to do a proper intro. Uh, Priya, look, I came across your content on YouTube. I was searching about acolyzer splints, something I've been uh, using on and off, but then sometimes I deliver it. I'm, I'm thinking, is it is it supposed to be this flimsy? And then your, I came across one of your videos, and then I saw more videos videos and I see that on a regular basis nowadays you've been creating some wonderful content so I was in awe of your content and just so everyone knows the content you make is primarily for patients and I have seen you in the last two months grow and grow and grow and it's been an absolute pleasure to see so uh, Priya tell us a little bit about yourself what you're yeah. practicing what got you into this crazy field of TMJ TMD yes yes so um, I'm over here in Portland Oregon and I'm working with my mentor Dr. Arthur Parker who has been doing TMJ work for, gosh, well over 40 years now. And he's just wonderful. And he's really just meeting him sort of changed the course of my life. And so I've been practicing general dentistry for 13 years. And about two years ago, I very 
randomly walked into my mentor's wife's jewelry store to get a clasp on a necklace fixed. So my mother-in-law gave me this beautiful necklace, but I just wanted, I felt like the clasp was a little bit flimsy. So I just wanted to change the clasp. And I walked in there and luckily uh, my mentor's wife, her name is Debbie. Debbie and I are both pretty chatty. And so we got to talking and she told me about the work that her husband does. She told me he stopped practicing general dentistry 35 years ago and he opened up his TMJ only practice sort of as a hobby, but also it's, it's his passion. And so I thought, huh, TMJ only, that's pretty rare because even if you refer to a TMJ specialist, they're doing a lot of other things and they're typically doing a lot of restorative dentistry, which we don't do at all. So I thought, huh? And I, I remember walking out of that store and I called my husband right away. He's a dentist as well. And we had been living in this area for about two years at that point, but I had had babies each year. So I didn't really know the dentists in this area. So I called my husband. And I said, do you know Dr. Arthur Parker? He said, yes, that's a huge name. He's the TMJ guy. Like, he's a big deal. I refer all my TMJ patients to him. And I said, well, you know, I kind of want to reach out to him and maybe shadow him. He said, definitely like go back in that jewelry store, talk to his wife, get his contact info and <laughs> <laughs> buy some jewelry. Yes. Wait, well, he probably didn't say that. He, <laughs> he said, talk to her, but don't buy some jewelry. <laughs> yeah, don't look at anything. Just talk to her. <laughs> um, so I went back in there and you know, the rest is history. I started shadowing him and I was just fascinated to see what he was doing. And so I was shadowing him maybe half a day, three times a week. And every single time I came in, the patients would say, are you taking over? Because Dr. Parker saved my life. You know, and I had I had one patient say they were about to commit suicide. They were in so much pain and Dr. Parker saved them. And I thought, is he arranging for all these patients to come in when I'm here? And, um, I thought, gosh, you know, I'm hearing this time and again, what is he doing? And so, you know, it turned into a mentorship. And then um, I just actually bought the practice last week and he's still working I'm with amazing. me. Yeah, I'm still learning from him. He's amazing. Congratulations. And, That's so, so, so good. Well know. done. Thank you. Thank you. So I can't believe you've been practicing for 13 years, though. You, you don't look like it. Oh, yes, it's hair dye. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Brilliant. But wh why? Why? What, what struck you about the fact that, you know, his wife, when you met her, she told you that uh, her husband has an interest in TMJ. But did you already have an interest? Uh, what, what was that connection that you felt that you needed to reach out to him? Yes. So I had taken a course in 2011 about sleep apnea in children. And I just remember thinking children with sleep apnea, like, you, you know, we are taught in school, or at least I was that it's associated with like very obese, older people. I didn't think about children. And I thought, huh. So when his wife spoke to me, she said that Dr. Parker is doing TMJ work. And he also works with the kids with small airways to help guide wow. their growth and development. So there is another aspect to our practice too. And so that kind of hooked me, but then also the TMJ part, there's so many patients I've seen in 13 years that came into the office and they could barely open their mouths. And I honestly had no clue what to do for them. I mean, they couldn't even open enough for me to get impressions, even if I wanted to do something. So I would put them on muscle relaxants, um, anti-inflammatories and say, come back in a week. If you're feeling a little better then that means we know it's your TMJ. And then I would just make a, a regular flat plane splint and hope. So Priya, at, at that stage, I think you, what you're describing is a very uh, typical situation for a lot of dentists. We don't see these um, issues so often. When they come, we try and think back to our anatomy from dental school. We're like, uh, what's going on? So we, we fail to make a diagnosis. Right. And maybe you went through that, that, right? Is that what you felt uh, at the stage that yeah. you experienced? Yes, definitely. And so um, when she said that he's been doing TMJ work for so long, I thought, oh my gosh, I can finally learn <laughs> how to do something beyond this because I felt like I would just give them a split and hope for the best. And I thought that's just not good enough for our patients. So I need to learn more. So then I thought maybe, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go, but I knew I definitely wanted to learn if he was open to it. And it just developed. Hey, it's Jazz. I'm just interfering into this episode to tell you the following. If you're listening to this podcast when it's released, then we're probably just a few days away from the splint course enrollment coming to an end. So I only wanted to open the course for two weeks because I want to limit the number of students because I want to focus on monthly mentorship. I'm going to do monthly coaching webinars for all your splint queries, for all your patients, because I realized when I did a Reservoir and Bridge course that actually people need opinions, people need mentorship. So I'm so excited for those who have joined me on the splint course. If you want to learn more about how to treat patients in general dental practice 
with splints and how you can improve myofascial pain and protect your precious veneers, how to find centriculation better, easier with clever appliances, then please do the splint course. I've worked really hard over the years to make lots of clinical videos. One thing I didn't have in the Resbine Bridge course, but I put in the splint course, is so many clinical videos, testimonials from patients, showing you step by step every single technique from TMJ diagnosis, from muscle examination, to the final delivery and adjustment to the splint. So I really hope you join me. Just a few days left. If you haven't already, check out splintcourse.com and enroll today. I love that story. <laughs> I love how it started with the necklace, uh, the jewelry, about the clasp. This is wonderful. Amazing. Well, let, let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of the episode. Um, talk, you know, your, I've seen your content, your wonderful way you, you make content and the, your patient mannerism and your education style is, is brilliant. So I can see, because one part of treating patient, patients with TMD is the ability to educate our patients, is the ability to take an empathetic approach with our patients. And you definitely have all those uh, fine qualities. Mm. So tell us, what is your protocol for a TMJ exam? Let's say uh, a patient comes in uh, and she's been referred and tell us what percentage um, are referred and what percentage come to you directly. And to be honest with you, one thing I did want to explore with you is now with the YouTube, um, and you messaged me saying, hey, you have a patient in the UK, Exeter, and that kind of stuff. And we've been emailing. Yes. I'm sure it's blown up how many patients. And I'm sure patients want to drive from everywhere. Because, Priya, even though I make my content for dentists, people have been watching my videos about IPR techniques with an orthodontist and about splints, which I make for dentists. And they are finding me and they're driving hundreds of miles to come and see me. I bet that's happening to you as well. So give us a, a flavor of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, people are trying to, to come from far. I mean, with COVID, there's a lot of limitations. And the tricky part is I really don't encourage people with actual intracapsular problems to come see me because that can be a four to six month resolution. And so I need them nearby. I, I do jaw manipulation. I can't do that on somebody that's coming from a different state, you know, or they have to travel far. Uh, so, so the people that I, I have encouraged, it's just been a few that have come from far, but it's mostly muscle myofascial problems. And, and those patients, um, I think a few of them have come, one has had great success. The other is still struggling, but that's TMJ. You know, there's often other parts of the body involved. And so we're trying to figure it out. I wish you, I wish he was closer because <laughs> I think we could have probably nailed it by now, but it's very hard to work with people that are far away. So I really prefer people close by, but it's been, but it's, it's, the, been it's the impact of social media. It's the impact of creating content. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing how, and, and I've joined these and maybe you should join this as well. Uh, I've joined this group on Facebook with people who are suffering from TMD and you should totally go and share your content there. It's about <laughs> thousands of people. I'm just wanting to understand their, their journey and understand their issues. Yes. And these people are, are really desperate and I know you're going to go into this. So tell us about these patients that seek you out or are referred to you, what is the typical um, exact first appointment? Yeah. So typical first appointment takes about an hour and that includes our examination and um, talking with our office administrator and getting an appointment set up. So it's not super long, but it is very thorough. So when these patients get referred to us, the first thing we do is we have a really comprehensive patient intake form. So it's a lot of paperwork, but it's for a good reason, because the paperwork has very specific questions as to pain. So are they having headaches? Are they having neck pain? Are they having ear pain? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it constant? Is it coming and going, fleeting? Um, stuffy ears. It covers so many things along with limited range of motion, noises in the joints, um, walking incidents. There's a lot in, in that intake paperwork along with a sleep apnea questionnaire um, because sleep apnea and TMJD are, are very much related. And then also a, a history on any accidents, any car accidents, any anything that could have caused whiplash. And so Sometimes people come in and they say, oh my gosh, this is a lot of paperwork. But then when they sit down for the exam, they say, I didn't even think that, you know, my accident two years ago, yeah, like I did have a really bad whiplash. I wouldn't have put that on there. So there's a good reason for all the questions, <laughs> but it starts with that intake paperwork. And then once I get that in my hands, I read it very thoroughly. Like I know everything before I go in there. And so um, there's that. That's a big aspect to it. And then, of course, when we go in, the first thing I do is I just sit down and I say, you know, I read through your paperwork. It sounds like your condition started, I don't know, two months ago, whatever it is. And I say, tell me your story, because people want to tell their story. People want to feel as though you're empathizing with them, which I do very much so. I, You know, these people are 
typically in a lot of pain. And so they tell their story. I listen. I take really detailed notes. I want to know everything. Um, and I ask questions every now and then. I try my best not to interrupt them. And then at the end, the two questions I always ask if they haven't covered it in their history is, what is your prior orthodontic treatment? Did, have you had any did you have braces? Did you have Invisalign? And when you had braces, did you have any permanent teeth extracted? Tell me. And so they tell me about their orthodontic history. And then I also ask history of injury to the head, neck, or jaw. Think back, even if it happened in your childhood, let me know if there was any sort of injury. Because even though our paperwork covers it, they don't necessarily think to tell us about a really bad accident, you know, when they were 12 or 13. So I, I go through that. And so once that part is done, then we can really get it started with actually physically examining the patients. So, so so that all is part of a very comprehensive history taking, which starts with the forms, continues on to their story. Um, and how much time do you think of that appointment is actually them telling you the story, you reading their paperwork, just so we get an idea? <laughs> Depending on how chatty they are, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, and, you you know, I kind of guide them because sometimes it's easy to get lost in in explaining your story. So I'll, I'll sort of, you know, nicely interrupt and sort of guide them back on track if they're getting a little off. Um, but yeah, usually about 10, 15 minutes. And, and also an important part of this is I observe them as they're talking to me. I observe their head posture. I observe if one shoulder's higher than the other. And then right after this exam, they, they actually have to get up from the chair they're sitting in and then sit down on our exam table. So I even observe the way that they walk. So this is all I'm, I'm getting an idea of their overall body posture, because that definitely plays into the mandible and its positioning. So what are you then uh, ex examining for? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking for um, a lot of these people have cervical misalignments. So these cervical spine, if they are rotated or um, these vertebrae, if they're rotated or if they're tilted at all, it'll show in their head posture, like they're looking off one way and they don't even realize it. Right. Um, and then discrepancies in shoulder height, and then even in gait, if someone's walking really straight, great. But if one leg's swinging out one way, it, it shows me that there may be some instability in the hips as well. So I try, you know, be discreet about it. But, <laughs> um, I, I do. Do, do you have like a diagram of the body and you're sort of making notes about any postural issues or is this something that is just on the side you just make a note of? No, we, we noted in our exam form too. So there is a okay. point during the exam where we actually lay the patient out on a table. So we don't have a dental chair in that room. We actually have a massage therapy table. So at that point, then I make more notes about it. But, uh, you know, these are just simple observations at the beginning. And then I comment on it later on in the exam. Sure. Tell us what's next. Yes. So what's next is I have the patient take a seat, just sitting facing me on the exam table. And the next part is a range of motion exam. So I use my little range of motion scale and I ask them to open. And I basically just say, you know, do what you can. Don't hurt yourself. And so I just kind of see what their range of motion is, ask them to move side to side. And we write that down. So there's an assistant in the room taking all the notes, writing it all down on the exam form. After the range of motion exam, then we... Um, and just tell the dentists out there, because we want to make it as educational as possible. Some uh, young dentist students might be listening. What are the figures that are, are normal? And then which figures are you thinking, oh, there's a red flag, there's something going on that we need to yeah. investigate further? Yeah. So 45 to 50 millimeters is normal opening. And then 10 to 12 side to side is normal lateral excursions. 25 millimeters opening and below can be indicative, is usually indicative of the jaw being locked closed, meaning the articular disc is displaced without reduction. So the jaw is locked. Somewhere in the 30s can be kind of tricky because there could be an intracapsular problem or it could be all myofascially driven, like the muscles are so angry that the patient isn't able to open more. So further evaluation is needed for that. So those are sort of the numbers involved Brilliant. there. That's really helpful. Thank you. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so after the range of motion exam, then we do a muscle palpation exam. So for the muscle palpation exam, I always say, I'm going to be feeling muscles around your head, neck, and jaws. And when I do so, I use about this much pressure. And so I put about three pounds of pressure on their like arm or shoulder, just to give them an idea of how much pressure I'll be using. And I say, if that gives you- I personally, I put my finger on their, on their forehead and I say, this okay. is how much pressure I'm putting because they need something to compare to. Yes. Because if, when I didn't used to do that and I just felt the muscle, they were like, yeah, they, 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 didn't, they don't have a reference to compare against. Right. So it's so important to give them a, a sensation they can compare to. So yes, I'm really glad is. you mentioned that. It's so, it's so important, right? And so I say, you know, it, once I'm feeling muscles around your head, neck and jaw, if you feel more than pressure, I want you to stop and grade it on a scale of one to three. One is a little tender, three is painful, two in between. 
And I say, if you just feel pressure, we'll keep going to the next spot. But if you feel more, interrupt me, grade it on that scale, and let me know if it's your right side, your left side, or both. And so they're usually good with that. And we start at the temples and we just go through the whole muscle exam. So I have a video on my YouTube <laughs> called Muscle Palpation Exam. And there's even a, uh, I think there's a form that you can download afterwards if you want to incorporate that into your paperwork. But I go Amazing. I'll, I'll link that on. So my producer will put that on so everyone can access that. I'll also put it on the blog on producer.co.uk so people can find easy access to this video because I think it's so important to be able to do that correctly as part of your record taking. Thank yes, you. yes. Yeah, it is important to do that correctly. And, you know, the muscles can give us so much information as to what's going on with the patient. And sometimes what's interesting is when I palpate the lateral pterygoid at the end of the exam, I do that. Right after the muscle palpation exam, I then put my fingers over the joints and ask the patient to open and close. And I'm feeling for pops and clicks, but what I often see is patients who are limited in range of motion, not locked, but limited in range of motion, they can open more after I've palpated and released that lateral pterygoid. It's so interesting, but I see it time and again, they're able to open a little bit more. So if you see that, if you observe that, that's telling you that this might be more muscular driven than an intracapsular issue. So I see that a lot. So the next step, I guess, which leads me into um, is checking. I just want to ask on that point, actually, just want to, because a great point you mentioned there. Now, this is a very controversial area, whether you can or cannot palpate lateral pterygoid. Uh, a lot of people think you can't. I mean, I, I appreciate your uh, expertise in this as well, because yeah. you've you know, got a mentor and you've limited your practice. So, But we need to appreciate that there's both sides. So some people from c cadaver studies say that, okay, it's, it's, it's not possible. Whereas what you have experienced and what you uh, feel is that, like, like a myofascial release. These patients are able to, to uh, open more. So you know, we, sh we have to be open-minded and consider that actually we don't know exactly if it's possible, but I, I, I love hearing your experience. I love um, getting different viewpoints on the podcast. So that's it. So we've got one point for, yes, we can palpate it. And I've also seen the video of you doing the release on yourself <laughs> uh, in, in that live video you did, which is, which is fantastic. Yes. Uh, so, so that's good to know. Right. So next what I do is I um, tell the patients that I'm going to place my fingers over their jaw joints and I'll watch and feel as they open and close a few times. So here I'm looking to see if their range of motion increased. I'm also feeling for any pops or clicks or crepitus, and you can feel for that pretty easily. And I'm watching for any deviation off to one side or an S pattern deviation, um, even on the way back up. I'm just watching for all of that. So watching, feeling, and letting my assistant know what to write down. And so that's sort of the next part. Then I ask the patient to lie down. I say, are you comfortable being on your back? So then they actually lie down on their back and I tell them we do a little bit of a postural exam here. And I say, I'm going to start by checking leg length and then I'll place my hands on your head and finish up my exam. So I do, I just go to the end of the table. I check their leg length and most, most people have some discrepancy. And so I make note of that because if there's a discrepancy in the leg length, that usually correlates with the discrepancy in the hip height. And so once there's discrepancies along the postural chain, it'll feed up and back down. And with the mandible being suspended in a sling of muscle, it's very responsive to those changes in the postural chain. So when I say postural chain, I mean the, the mandible, I mean the, up, the, the spine itself, the shoulders, the hips, and the feet. So looking at all of that. And sort of this is really fascinating because we don't get taught any of this uh, at dental school. I don't know what your experience was about uh, the extent they went into this. Did you get taught any of this at dental school? No. <laughs> I got taught none of this at dental school. No, mm. and I would never have even thought to look at leg length when I'm doing a TMJ exam, right? Like when I first started shadowing my mentor here, I could not figure out why he was checking leg length. And Dr. Parker is amazing, but he is a man of few words. And so I always poke him and ask him a lot of questions. And so after the first couple observational sessions that I had with him, I just said, you know, I don't get it. Let's sit down and talk. And that's when he explained the postural chain the same way I just did. And I said, that makes sense. And so that's that's another indication as to whether, I know we're going to touch on this later, whether to get a body worker, a physical therapist, a, a nuca chiropractor involved at a later stage. So it's just sort of giving me more pieces of the puzzle. Brilliant. Fantastic. You, you explained that really well. Fantastic. So you've la laid them down, you've done uh, the leg length. What happens next? Yes. Yeah, so then um, I do leg length and then I actually sit down and I say, I'm going to put my fingers in your ears. I know that sounds funny, but when I do that, I can feel inside your jaw joints. So I just use my little pinkies and I place them in the ears and I put just a little bit of pressure going anteriorly and I ask them to open and close. And this is the part of the exam where you can actually feel closing clicks really well. Opening clicks are often like 
you can feel them from here. But the closing clicks, you can't always. They're just softer. They're just quieter. So here you can feel that. You can feel crepitus really well. And, and so that's just sort of gives you confirmation as to what you felt from here. And it gives you more information oftentimes too. So I do that. Th that, that area is, is much better uh, innovated than the lateral poles. And, and that's why it, another reason it gives you so much information. So, so if you yeah. felt the lateral poles and, and sometimes they're, they're not feeling any pain, sometimes I'm sure you found intraorically that actually reveals that the, there might be some p inflammation, some pain. Is that, is that what you found? Yes. Yes, I have. I found the exact same thing. And so, so that part of the exam is pretty quick. And then the last part I say, I'm just going to take a look inside your mouth now. So when I look inside their mouth, I'm looking for a lot of things, really. Um, I'm looking for scalloping on the lateral borders of the tongue. That scalloping on those lateral borders is telling me that, you know, there's probably not enough room in their mouth for their tongue or they're using their tongue as sort of a soft night guard or um, it's just it shouldn't be there, essentially. And so when I see that scalloping, I know that tongue isn't always in the proper position up against the roof of the mouth with the light suction. It's doing a little bit more than it should. So I look for that scalloping on the lateral borders of the tongue. I look for tori, palatal tori, mandibular tori, a narrow arched palate. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at molar classification, looking for deep bites. I'm looking for cross bites, uh, looking for signs of clenching and grinding, clear signs like wear on the teeth, recession, abfraction, craze lines, so like vertical fractures in the enamel, gives us lots of clues. I'm looking at how much space the tongue takes up in their mouth. So we call it malampati score here. I'm not sure if you call it that there, but I asked. It's same, yeah, we okay, call it that here okay, as well, yep. Okay. So stick their tongue out. I'm looking at what I can see in the back. So I'm looking for the malampati score. Uh, there's a lot that I'm looking at. And the whole time my assistant's taking notes, I'm looking for missing teeth. Uh, so I'm looking for a, lo a lot in that in that part, uh, just to kind of give us more clues as to maybe how they got there. And so those class two div two patients, the majority of our, our TMJ patients, that class two div two just sort of doesn't allow the mandible to come down and forward where it usually wants to be, where the muscles, joints, and ligaments are the happiest. And so we see that a lot, the class two div two, especially with our patients that are- As a restorative dentist, they're also the patients that uh, just give us so much trouble yes. uh, in terms of restorative treatment planning, longevity or restorations, the amount of resistance they put on that restoration. So um, yeah, no one likes these class two div two patients. Sorry if you're class two div two, but yeah, sorry. you give us a lot of hard work. <laughs> it is a lot of hard work. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes, yes. So I mean- Yes, absolutely. Carry on. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's it. I mean, once we do the occlusal exam, I say, you know, you can sit up and have a seat back in your original spot. And then I just go over everything with them. And I always start with, you know, we talk a lot about TMJ and we talk about TMD at our practice. And I said, TMJ, I always say TMJ is not, it's not a diagnosis. It just means temporomandibular joints. But if there's a problem within those joints, it will manifest as clicking, popping, crackling noises, or episodes of the jaw locking. So if they have any of those, I say, clearly there's an issue there. And then I say TMD, which is temporomandibular disorder or dysfunction. It recognizes that there's a group of muscles that work together to guide and support the jaw. If or when those muscles become dysfunctional, usually due to chronic clenching, chronic grinding, sometimes even just the way the teeth fit together, um, unilateral cross bites can be very dysfunctional for the joints. So I say sometimes even just the way the teeth fit together or imbalances along the postural chain can make these muscles dysfunctional. They can get trapped in a chronic pain and spasm cycle. And when that happens, it can lead to a lot of different symptoms with number one being headache, closely followed by ear and neck related concerns, jaw pain, tingling in the jaw, in the extremities. There's just so many things that go along with it that TMD is often called the great imposter disease because there's just so many different things that can come along with it. And so depending on which one they have more of, or if they have both, I just explain everything and then how we treat it and how we can help them. But the most amazing thing is that I don't think the literature on TMD will ever reveal the truth because there are so many confounding factors, right? right. Including the fact that the, the current accepted model in literature is the, the biopsychosocial model of disease. So we know there's more to it than just um, trauma. Like there's so many patients that have really severe signs of bruxism, but they will never manifest um, never. as having pain or TMD. Never. And, and when you have these other people who, who don't have as much history of micro or macro trauma, but then they suffer so much more. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I don't think the evidence will ever be able to find the, the truth in that, wherever the truth may be, because it's just impossible to study. It's impossible to get the N numbers. Yes. It's impossible to get the sleep studies. It's impossible to account for every single factor yes. that can be contributing. So where do you think, because because that's where we can discuss theories and opinions, because that's the best we have. Because the, the other arms of evidence-based dentistry are clinical expertise and the patient experience and patient values. And we have to remember that those two make up the three arms of evidence-based dentistry. Mm -hmm. So tell me your theories on the most common reasons that someone will turn up to you with TMD and why others who also may be chronic clenchers, grinders, they won't get TMD. What's your take on that? Yeah, so my opinion is, is you know, and I know I've been talking a lot about this, but it goes back to the postural dynamics. It goes back to the history. So I had one patient who's um, class one molar occlusion. Her uh, yeah, Overall, her occlusion was beautiful, right? She had two fillings replaced and boom, suddenly her whole right side began hurting, especially just right up in here. Felt like her scalp was on fire. It felt like somebody was hitting her in the head with a two by four. Her jaw was constantly aching. Her whole life changed because of those two fillings. And she said, what happened here? So we got her in. I made her the orthotics. I started treating her. Uh, and, and with her history, what came out is she had suffered four really severe whiplash incidents and car accidents over a matter of like five years. And so her cervical vertebrae were totally not in alignment. And when that happens, the muscles that attach there, they start compensating. Everything starts compensating and eventually something gives. You can only compensate for so long if it's very extreme compensation, right? And so it was staying open for those two minor fillings. I mean, they were class two fillings. They were tiny. They weren't anywhere near the nerve. But just staying open, it just triggered everything. And all these symptoms came on. And now we've got her back to like 90% of those symptoms are gone, maybe 95. I think last time I spoke to her, but I mean, it took a toll on her life. She had two young kids. She was just crying all the time. You know, she was debilitated. So I guess what I'm trying to say is those incidents that of whiplash, even if you think you've recovered or you're, you're okay, but your neck is just a little stiff or a little painful, sometimes they can come back to haunt you later. And so these people that have had multiple accidents, it's usually very active people too, um, snowboarders, skiers. We see a lot of musicians, violinists that are holding their necks in a certain way. I think that plays into a lot of it. And like you said, there's not a lot of research on that. Zero, because I've been really delved deep into the literature. In fact, one of my comments on your YouTube videos some while ago was yeah. discussing literature and stuff, uh, as you may remember. But, you know, um, I have to admit, I, I know nothing or very little uh, about the postural chain. Uh, and I, I would like to sort of learn more about that. I'll probably be watching your videos more and more to learn more about that. But yeah, I, I know nothing about that. So I'm the first to say that. So in my view of the world, I think the reason why some people switch uh, and, and get the signs or, or the symptoms, they complain of TMD uh, issues, is, is adaptive capacity. Um, is that something that you're uh, familiar with, the adaptive capacity theory? Well, go ahead and tell me. <laughs> sure. So the uh, adaptive ca capacity theory is that, in a way, also interlinks with the weakest link theory. So we, we, you know, there's the teeth, there's a periodontium, there's the muscles, and somewhere along that sort of system, in the masticatory system, something is the weak point. Like, for example, some patients will get uh, myofascial pain, but not so much intracapsular, and the, and the teeth will not wear down so much. Whereas other people, they will destroy their teeth. But the adaptive capacity, i.e. the ability for that system to heal, um, or how resilient that system is, is above the threshold of them getting pain. And again, we don't have the evidence to prove this. Right. So uh, it's just one of those uh, theories and one of those things which I like discussing with clever people like you because mm -hmm. there's there's not enough TMJ geeks out there and it's, it's, it's nice to have that. So um, if you don't mind, I just want to, because I know dentists are thinking this while they're listening to this, is that specific patient that you mentioned who had those two restorations and it, it maybe it was her mouth staying open for that long or um, you know a, a change in occlusion that, that affected her, mm -hmm. either the postural chain or her adaptive capacity uh, in whatever way. Um, how, just give us a flavor of how you treated her. Yeah, sure. So we um, got her into my TMJ practice and we did our full workup. And so we always take a, a CBCT scan. And so that gives us information about the bony components of the joints. It shows us, we take a good look at the upper cervical vertebrae and we're looking for rotations in them. Uh, we look at airway. We look at a lot of things in that. And uh, so we got our, the CBCT. And then what we do right after that is we get, of course, molds of the teeth if they're able to open enough. And uh, after the molds, then we use a TENS unit, a muscle stimulator, and it gets the muscles in the head, neck and jaw nice and relaxed. And so we use that to deprogram those muscles. So they 
go to their correct resting length. And then we record that position with a very sophisticated jaw tracking technology that's precise down to tenths of a millimeter. So it's telling us exactly where to position the mandible so that the muscles are in their most relaxed position. So for her, it was all myofascial. There were no joint issues at all. And so just getting those muscles mm -hmm. relaxed was super important. When we used the muscle stimulator, the TENS machine, I also put an aqualizer in her mouth. I wanted to disclude her teeth. I wanted to get those muscles as deprogrammed as possible. And so even when I took the aqualizer out to measure that really relaxed position, I said, don't touch your teeth together. <laughs> don't touch your teeth together at all. And we'll kind of go from here. So then once I got the information I needed, we made her a daytime orthotic and a nighttime one. With the orthotics, uh, with the daytime one, we always ask our patients to take it out when they eat or drink, anything but water. Uh, and then eventually we wean them off of that daytime one as their symptoms get better and better. So we give them the orthotics and then we see our patients once a week for our own therapy in our office. So we have several rooms with those massage tables that I mentioned earlier. And what I do is I do kind of like a subtle head and neck massage, a release of these muscles right at the base of the occiput. And then I do a little bit more work extra orally. And then intra orally, I go in and I release those lateral pterygoids. That is not a fun thing for these patients. Those muscles are very hot. A lot of patients sort of tear up when I do this. And I just say, there's a good reason for this. <laughs> uh, we're bringing fresh blood flow, fresh oxygen to those muscles and promoting lymphatic drainage. Uh, it doesn't feel great, but it helps a lot. And so uh, again, like I said, a lot of these patients, I see an increase in range of motion. She wasn't one of those. Her range of motion was fine. But once we got her into therapy, she noticed that her symptoms improved by 85% within a month. It was very fast. I mean, she felt relief within a week, but that 85% was within a month. And I said, what can, what are we missing? What can we do to get you to 90%, 95%, 100%? So we went back to those whiplashes and I just said, I still think this is playing a role. And she was seeing a chiropractor at the time. And I said, you know, you've seen this chiropractor a number of times and I hate, to, I, and I don't ever do this really because I don't like stepping on toes. And I just said, would you perhaps just because you're in so much, you were in so much pain, be open to seeing someone that I recommend. And so I really work well with these upper cervical chiropractors. So here we call them NUCA chiropractors, National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association, or Atlas Orthogonal Chiropractors. They do things the same way, they diagnose the same way, but NUCA treats with their hand and Atlas Orthogonal treats with like a percussion instrument. But the adjustments that they do are not forceful or cracking or jerky. It's very, very light pressure applied to the Atlas C1 um, to help it get back into alignment, followed up with other things. And so they do a lot with the upper cervical vertebrae particularly C1. And so she said she was open to that. And once she started seeing the Nuka chiropractor, I told her, I said, the first three visits with that chiropractor, I want you to come back and see me within 24 hours of your adjustment, because these adjustments change the head posture, which can change the bite against my splint, my orthotic. We mm -hmm. want everything Absolutely. working together, right? So I don't want my splint holding her back from progress with this new adjustment she's had. So those first two or three adjustments are the ones that make the biggest difference typically. So that's why I say for the first two or three, come back and see me. So once she started seeing the nuclear chiropractor, that got her to 95%. So she's still not at 100%, but her quality of life is so improved. And I'm still working with her. I'm not going to give up. I want to get her to 100%, but, but she's thrilled. Brilliant. She's thrilled. Brilliant. Well, the geek inside me has to ask you, uh, and we'll cover this quickly because there's a few more things to cover, but uh, difference between a daytime and a nighttime uh, orthotic, just uh, simply, but also, um, are you familiar with Jankelson's orthotic? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So uh, okay. the Jankelson's orthotic, I don't know about that, but we use his method, the neuromuscular Sure. Scan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that. It's just using the TENS machine to find out the, yeah. the corrected length of the muscle and then building the appliance to that length. So yeah, fantastic. So you, and that, is that going to be applied to both the daytime and the yes. nighttime orthotic? So, just give us a flavor of the difference. Yes. So it's the same prescription built into both appliances. One different thing that we do from Jenkelson's method is um, we also look at the CBCT and the position of the condyles. We take that scan when people are in centric occlusion. And so it shows us where the condyles are when their teeth are together. And if they're too far posterior, what we usually see is Jenkelson's method is actually asking us to move them anterior. I've never really seen it. Yeah. So, so, but if it's not, if it's not anterior enough, I've done this now long enough to Sometimes I don't go exactly with Jenkelson's 
sometimes I go a little bit anterior to it or a little bit, I'll kind of fudge it a little bit to where I know they're going to have a better result. So, so that's kind of how we do it. And uh, with the daytime and night. Is that mostly with the, the airway in mind? Airway in mind and position of the condyle. Because if it's too far back, okay. it's impinging on that retrodiscal tissue. So both. Okay. both. And I do Brilliant. encourage Fantastic. sleep tests for a lot of my patients as well. Uh, not all of them want to do it. <laughs> They're like, I'm here to get out of pain. Just get me out of pain. But I, I you know, I tell them what I see. Um, and then the difference between daytime and nighttime orthotic, same prescription built into both. The daytime one is made out of an orthodontic Invisalign type material. But what we do is we build up pads of triad on the posterior aspects and even on the canines. So canines back, we build up pads of triad with indentations, bite indexes to guide their upper teeth where to rest, putting the jaw in the three-dimensional rest position. And then the nighttime appliance is a lot thicker, essentially, because it's a lot more force can be generated at night. And so we don't want it to break. So it's quite a bit thicker, but same prescription built into both. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. You cover that really well as well. Uh, what percentage of your patients, just a quick fire round, what percentage of your patients do you think have the signs of bruxism? Oh, gosh. <laughs> 95. Yep, I concur. Yeah. Uh, what percentage of your patients that um, you send for a sleep test come back with a, a positive diagnosis or a high enough um, AHI index that, you know, they actually are diagnosed with sleep apnea. Oh, 95, really high. Isn't it just amazing? Yes. Isn't it just fascinating how it's, it's like this really this um, this elephant in the room. It's something that we need to, as, as a healthcare profession, as dentists, we need to be screening more of this. And I'm on a real mission here to, to I don't teach, I can't teach stuff because I'm, there are people out there, especially in the UK where I am, uh, who can teach us better. But in the UK, we don't have enough clear pathways to get patients help. When I send these patients to the GP, the GP was the doctor was never taught about airway in the medical school. So it's a real uh, lack of clear referral pathways. I'm a very frustrated dentist for that reason. I think in the US, you have better pathways in place, I feel. We do. And we have um, an institute called the Breathe Institute in Southern California yes. that is is all about this. And so really what I see with a lot of my patients too is that low tongue posture, the small airway, um, they have to breathe through their mouths. And so I, I did a video called uh, Tongue Tie Airway and TMJ Disorders. And I feel like that would, it, you know, again, my channel is more for people looking for answers for themselves, but I feel like Dentists can learn a lot too. It's just not the technical. We jargon. can learn so much, Priya. Yeah. Honestly, I guys, you, if you listen to this and you and you, and you like what Priya is saying, in the, in the sense that her style is so good, is very educational. These these videos that she makes for patients, I, I guarantee you're going to learn so much. So please do uh, check out uh, her channel, uh, Priya Mystery, the TMJ Doc. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I've learned so so much from it as well. I think it's great. And and you know what? The the problem, Priya. Look, the problem with us UK dentists, and I'm you know, I, I say this that we sometimes. We're very much like, oh, the evidence, the evidence, the evidence. Whereas what I want to do with my podcast, I want to bring um, differing opinions. So a lot of people will, will listen to this podcast and think, whoa, what, what, what you're saying about the, the posture, because we weren't taught it then school, they're like, wait, what's going on? What's going right. on? But uh, I always encourage my listeners to keep an open mind. There's, there's so much, yes. so many unknown unknowns. So I'm loving the direction that um, that went in. Uh, another quick fire question is, when your patients come back uh, with a positive diagnosis of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, do you change your appliance now to a mandibular advancement splint? Uh, if it's mild or moderate sleep apnea, yes. If it's severe, then I just say, you know, CPAP and use what we what we give you because most of the time we move them anteriorly anyway. So it opens their airway a bit. But to really know what our appliance is doing, they have to take a sleep test without it and with it. And most people don't want to do that. I mean, mm, these sleep mm -hmm. tests can be very expensive. They're not always covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm super excited about the Breathe Institute. They've actually set up a way to ship my patient a sleep test. They take it and their ENT, their medical doctor, their ENT actually looks at the results, gives us the diagnosis. And their sleep test is really, really great too, because they have a lot of questions that come along with it. They're trying to determine not just sleep apnea, but upper airway resistance syndrome, whether this person's a mouth breather. And so I haven't incorporated that into my practice yet, but I'm looking forward to doing it because it's a way for me to offer these sleep tests, but they're still read by an MD because as dentists, we can't diagnose sleep apnea. There's a way to do it that's cheaper for the patients where it's like, we don't have, they don't have to spend $2,000 on a sleep test. We can do it for a couple hundred dollars here, you know? So 
I'm trying to incorporate all that, but I haven't done it quite yet. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's far more than we're doing at the moment. And uh, Jufa, I'm also looking for a good home test solution. So if anyone's listening to the podcast and can help me with that in the UK, but especially I'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah. Uh, the next one I'm going to ask you then is at which point do you think GDPs, general dentists, should be referring to someone uh, like you who's limited their practice to uh, the treatment of TM TMD? I guess the way we look at our patients is I always say there's we look at our cases based upon degree of difficulty with four levels, four being four levels, four being the highest. So fourth, the highest level is a locked jaw. That's the most difficult thing to treat, jaw locked closed. And then the third level is some myofascial concerns as well as some joint involvement, clicking, popping, especially clicking at the end of opening. That indicates the disc is more displaced than at the beginning of opening. So that's kind of our level three. Level two and one are really no joint involvement. It's all myofascial. So what I would say is level two, level one, anything myofascial without joint involvement, try to treat it at your practice. You may be surprised at the success that you have. Uh, I would just make them a nighttime appliance with an aqualizer bite. And I, again, I have a video on that. I'm not trying to plug my channel every five minutes, but it's way easier to have you watch my video. I, am. I want to plug it. <laughs> I want to plug it. I think you should see it. And I, it's, a, it's a video that I found you on. Oh, right. It was a fantastic video. Uh, and I, so, so I've got loads of these uh, aqualizers in the in the fridge, uh, and I like to give them for so sort of people coming with acute pain and stuff. Uh, but your uh, video, so I, I don't do because here's the different uh, opinions and whatnot. Yes, I do a lot I of anterior hear. midpoint stop appliances, but the, but the downside of that is that yes, the airway impacts having. Whereas I think the with the the tens approach that you take, I think it puts them in a better position for the airway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do like your approach as well. Uh, and I've got a couple of patients I've identified would be beneficial for that. But but going back to your point, the advice you gave there was to to give it a go, try it because myofacial pain is the most common, yes. thankfully, thankfully, uh, diagnosis. And people in the level one area, there's more of them than thank yes. goodness for people in level four. There's and I love more. that classification is really helpful. Yeah. And, and really to ask, start asking every single patient if they have headaches, if they have neck pain, if they have jaw pain, they won't necessarily think to tell their dentist about their headaches or their neck pain, right? Of course, jaw pain, they're going to tell you, but they don't think, and, and you'll be surprised at how many people say, yeah, I have headaches all the time. Or I, I, you know, I've had migraines for 20 years or whatever you may hear. You can lessen those headaches drastically with these appliances if they're made correctly. If you're putting their muscles in their happy. Amen, place. sister. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's amazing to do that for someone. They look forward to seeing you. They're not coming in for something they're dreading. They're like, you made me feel better. I mean, it's so gratifying. It's, it's wonderful. You, you, you're so right, right on the money there, because look, I love doing my restorative dentistry. I love doing teeth straightening and stuff. And I get that perfect on lay on. I'm like, I'm happy. <laughs> but you know what? None of this compares to when I have that patient, that young lady who's been taking painkillers right. for her headaches. Uh, and I'm the first dentist to ask her about her headaches. And I just make an appliance and I give her some um, a patient education. Right. Uh, and then and suddenly her headaches are gone right. and then I get a thank you. Right. That means so much and I absolutely love that. But you know what? I, I, I've explored already. Our approaches are different, which is which is amazing, right? We have two different approaches. Uh, I, I do a lot of anterior only appliances um, yeah. and then you do uh, the, the way that you describe, but they both work. So there is a lot of crossover in terms of how we can get our the muscles of the patient relaxed in a better state. Yeah. Uh, and I think as a profession, we, we can learn more uh, through research and stuff in the future. I don't know if we'll ever get that high quality evidence that we need, but it's just the beauty of it. And I think we just have to accept that um, there's no unified theory. And, and that's the beauty of it instead of getting frustrated by it. Yeah, no. Um, and I'm very mindful of the time, but yes, carry on. Sorry, just to add to that. I mean, there's so many causes of TMJD. There are a lot of solutions too. I mean, it would make sense that there's not just one right approach. And with TMJD, keeping an open mind, continuing to learn is so important. It's not as simple as doing a class one filling. Like we've, we're have we all taught to do that the same way. But TMJD can be a whole body issue for some of these people. And so just keeping an open mind, like you said, palpating the lateral pterygoid. I had somebody already multiple people approach me. That's not even possible. I say, well, I think it is. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. But, can... you know, yeah. What, what, what really, and excuse, excuse my French, but what really pisses me off, right, <laughs> is when uh, dental professionals, right, like 
we 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 have this like closed mind yeah and we don't accept that there are other ways there are unknown unknowns yes. and they go by the very poor quality evidence that exists yes. right yes. Um, so i hope when 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 i commented on your video i hope you didn't feel like i was like disagreeing with you i was just coming at a different angle i, I kept a very open mind uh because 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 exactly what you said we don't know the answers and we need to keep an open mind and appreciate there are other ways to, to think about this so i i would encourage all dentists to think yeah. more openly and i don't see the point of saying that's not possible yeah uh, just because someone has it is we don't know we i don't i think there are a lot of unknown unknowns yeah no so i, I, think I you don't were very stop kind. making content for that reason keep going you were really kind in your comments i've had people come after me i've had i've been called a moron people are very mean <laughs> online so um i your comment was totally <laughs> Totally great and gracious. Above board. Good, yeah. good. And that's the way we should approach it. We should yeah. we should be uh, approaching a healthy discussion and yeah. whatnot and, and wanting to learn from each other. And Agreed. I appreciate your reply as well and wanting to, to learn my perspective yes. as well, which yeah. was really wonderful. So thank you for that. Of course. My last question then is, when do you involve, uh, so you talked about the Nuka chiropractors already. Uh, when do you involve physical therapists uh, or physiotherapists, as we know in the UK? And also, uh, do you ever involve like psychological interventions, like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy? Do you ever get those specialties involved? Uh, I usually get the Nuka chiropractors, the physical therapists, and I have, I've talked to patients about the cognitive behavioral therapy, but a lot of them don't want to go that route. I had one that is doing transcendental meditation and she, it's helped her. Wow. So that's one, but a lot of people don't even want to go that route. I, I almost wish I could just say, can you just do it and <laughs> tell me like, how you feel? But you know, <laughs> if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. And so a lot of them are open to seeing the physical therapists. And we have some great TMJ physical therapists just very close by to my office here. And they have a uh, biofeedback machine. So it's showing you which muscles are firing uh, in different postures. And so they actually have you do different postures and they kind of train you to, when you feel stress or anxiety coming on to assume these postures that bring the muscles back down to a calmer level. So they give you kind of tools that you can use at home. They, they do a lot of, uh, myofascial release. They show a lot of exercises that bring relief to our patients. And so I do utilize the, the TMJ physical therapists. I, I adore them, the ones that we work with, um, the Nuka chiropractors. And like I said, I wish more would do the cognitive behavioral <laughs> therapy, but a lot of them just don't don't want to go that route for whatever reason. Brilliant. And for, for, for these complex cases, it's definitely a, a team approach I found. Yes. So last question is, um, I've been doing a fair amount of research on what is the best way to treat someone with a disc displacement without reduction. Okay. And the literature is very much, we don't know, because so many different ways actually work. So I, I want to hear um, Priya's view. What's Dr. Priya Mystery's um, most successful intervention yeah. or recommended intervention for someone with a disc displacement without reduction? Yes. So what we do at my office is we actually say, you know, if they're not even open enough for us to get impressions, we've got to get them open more, right? So we've got to get get that disc reduced or at least the muscles calm down a little bit more so that they have a more a, a better range of motion. So what we do is we say, we call them emergency appointments, which sounds a lot scarier than it is, but we just say it's about an hour long. We have the patient come in and we use the TENS with an aqualizer in the mouth for 45 minutes. Once that's done, we turn the TENS off, we take the aqualizer out. And like I said, we do that muscle release at the base of the occiput. We do a little bit more extra oral work, but the intraoral work is really what's uh, unique in this, in terms of getting the jaw more, more open. So we do that myofascial release with the lateral pterygoid, the temporalis tendon insertion, that area. And for a lot of these people, it's quite a bit of pressure you have to put in that area to get those muscles to kind of let go because the lateral pterygoid attaches to the disc, right? So the superior head does. And so once we've done the myofascial release on, on both sides a couple times, then what we do really, that's really unique, uh, is we actually do osteopathic manual jaw manipulation. So my mentor, Dr. Parker, he studied with osteopaths, TMJ physical therapists, naturopaths. He's traveled the world. I mean, he's been around before Google and he's worked with some of the best people, <laughs> but he's a big believer in osteopathic work, hands-on manual therapy. And so he, with all of that, he's developed a method to actually manipulate the jaw. So we do one side at a time and then both together and manipulating the jaw so that we can get the condyle and the disc back in their proper relationship. And so it does not always work at that first emergency appointment. So typically we'll see the patient once or twice a week and we can get them unlocked usually the second or third time. And as soon as they're unlocked, we take impressions because as soon as they leave, they can lock up again. 
So TMJ work is often two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And it can be frustrating for everybody involved, but I always make sure to tell my patients that like, it's not going to be, it took you a long time to get here. It's not going to be fixed overnight. And some of these people with jaws that are locked, some of them totally get it. And other people just, they just want to be fixed right away. And it's really hard. It's, it's hard emotionally for them. It's, it's kind of draining for me a little bit too, but um, I, I would imagine it's hard to have your mouth stuck, you know, so where you can't open, you can't eat and, you know, quality of life goes down a lot. And so uh, that's how we treat it. And then what- Pri, Pri, I just want to ask you, I mean, it's great you uh, mentioned that and it's amazing that by the third appointment, you can get that uh, result. But I just want to explain for the dentists who yeah. perhaps have no insight into what happens during this. Once you've got the disc to recapture onto the condyle, that that's going to change their occlusion. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that? And where, where does a potential prosthodontic or restorative work come into the future? Is that always necessary? That's a good question. Yeah. So when they actually lock, that's when they notice, hey, my bite feels a little bit off. And so if it's a little bit off, if we can get them unlocked and get it stable, we see how they are after four to six months. Oftentimes we can regain the bite. It's not an issue, but there are some times that we cannot. And so there was one patient that came in locked and her bite was so off and she was fixated on it. Will my bite come back? Will my bite come back? Will my, and finally, Dr. Parker and I just said, we don't know. It probably won't, <laughs> you know? And, and so we didn't want to guarantee that and it didn't. So we sent her to an orthodontist after we got her joints stable. So the way we like to describe it is sort of like the two joints and the teeth coming together, fitting together like cogs on a gear. It's like a tripod effect. And what happens when you cut off one leg of a tripod, the whole system goes out of balance. So if, if the disc is completely displaced and the jaw is locked, of course, the bite's going to be a little bit off, right? And if we can get the disc back in alignment, there's a chance we can recapture that bite. But what if the bite becomes totally off, right? Because the patient's been compensating for so long. And she was a patient with the bicuspid extraction, retraction, orthodontia. It was clear she had been trying to grind her way out of that position for years and years and years. She's in her 60s and her teeth were just beat up from all of that. So it's like, you know, we think of another way to describe it too is like a door with the two hinges and, you know, the opening and closing portion of it. If, if every time you close a door, you have to kind of shove it by the doorknob to get it to lock, eventually the hinges give out. So you replace the hinges, but you didn't fix the original problem. So same, same sort of thing. And so she finally accepted it and she went to go get orthodontia once we got her joint stable. So you can't always recapture that bite. Amazing. Priya, you've answered all my questions oh and you gave so much value today. Yeah. And we discussed interesting theories, some controversial stuff, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. And I think you were so uh, humble that way that, that you delivered that. And uh, you were so accepting the fact that, you know what, some dentists may disagree and that's fine. But I just want everyone to to play nice, you know, let's, let, let's all listen yeah. to the different theories and, and share together. But I, I definitely think what you're doing on YouTube is uh, such a great thing, mm -hmm. um, if not for dentists, but for patients. I can see the comments that you're getting mm -hmm. or, or on YouTube. It's just phenomenal how much your content is helping. So please Thank do you. continue that. Yes. And thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast today. Yes, thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you. There we have it. I hope you enjoy that perspective, the varying opinions. Like, you know, I, I don't believe that we can palpate the lactopterygoid, uh, but Dr. Priya Mystery and many other great clinicians feel you can. So there's a beauty in this. There's a beauty in varied perspectives. It's just the way dentistry is. We're never going to have this unified theory. Uh, when I had Krina Panchal on the podcast, the, the physiotherapist, she had her own views. And there's a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of difference as well. So let's appreciate the beauty of it all. So I hope you'll join me same time, same place next week when we join another episode of your favorite dental podcast. Please do leave a review, write a review. I love reading them. So if you're listening on Apple, don't just give me five stars or how many of the stars you want to. Actually write a review. I read every single one. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. I'll see you next time.